Uh, well, first, for those who don't remember, it was, as I said, one of the biggest sexual assault uh, cases in American history going back to the early 90s. And it went so far as to, at the end of it, you got personal assurances for both uh, the president at the time, Bush Sr., and then uh, the secretary at the time, uh, Dick Cheney, that it would never happen again. Fast forward 22 years later, uh, if that were only the case, um, are you shocked by how little progress has been made uh, in the two decades since America's conscience was shocked? I admit to being cynical, so um, I'm not exactly surprised by this outcome as it has failed to evolve, but I, I, I have to say I'm more disappointed than in. In, in the uh, trials and tribulations of me going through uh, the tailhook debacle with the military, one of the only things that I really clung to as a military service member was that the chain of command was authentically concerned with removing the criminal element from within. And unfortunately, I just keep getting disappointed over and over. This is a kind of a reoccurring theme that removing criminals that um, perpetrate sexual assault or rape in the military has just not been a priority. You know, I was going through the notes before we started, Paula, and um, first of all, no one was prosecuted, um, which echoes familiarly to present day, how this works. We'll go through some of the numbers in a second, but the reaction from your commanding officer, uh, then Rear Admiral John Snyder, he said, uh, to you in effect, that's what you get when you go to a hotel party full of drunken aviators, uh, like you should have known better. Um, well, it made me think, there was a comment that General Welsh, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, just recently in testifying to the Senate, uh, to the Armed Services Committee, uh, with women on the Senate committee here, he said in effect, you know, part of the problem is these women, these young women who are now in the military have been raised in a hookup mentality as if they've got a change here that they, if not had it coming, should have known better. It's amazing, the mentality with all the attention still uh -huh. hasn't changed. It, uh, I, um, I, I just, um, I try not, again, to um, paint everyone in the military with a, a, a broad brush, but it is pretty much an indication of the overall attitude of senior leadership especially. That, um, you know, I would hope in the generations to come, they're not going to share that attitude that somehow blaming women by joining the military has created a problem for him. In fact, the people that come into the military come into the military, I believe there are two types. Those that really wholeheartedly want to serve and bring everything they have with them. And then there are those that may or may not have another option. And I think our leadership has a, uh, an ability to form both of those personality types into a great military person. And when you discount half of the people walking in the door to serve their country with uh, a hookup mentality, it's time for that attitude to go. It's time for that leadership to go. You know, you have since uh, what you had to endure in 91, you have been very involved in this issue uh, and you've been close to people both uh, that served and still are active. And, and I'm curious, when we go through the numbers, a jaws drop for those of us who haven't worn a uniform when you hear basically of the estimated sexual assaults here, 26,000, only 3,000 are reported and only 300 prosecuted. Um, the numbers going even further as to how many each day, 500 men and women each week are reported to have been assaulted. Um, does it happen in this volume because of the culture that maybe some of the people have gone through or the idea that there's a permissiveness from above that, hey, it, it, it comes with the territory? Well, I think that if you spoke to any of the victims of this um, epidemic of sexual assault, you would you would probably hear a reoccurring theme. Uh, they first were hesitant or didn't report the crime because they were afraid of retaliation. And then most importantly, there's really no uh, sense of an authentic desire to remove criminals from our military. So 
most victims would probably say they just never believed anything would happen to the perpetrator. And they're right. I mean, the numbers you just read support that the military has really not been interested in removing the criminal element in the cases of sexual assault or rape. They've been more interested in um, creating training programs and um, focusing on how it, it, it affects their reporting, not really how it's affecting their readiness or their mission accomplishment or the professional development of those people in the armed services. So it's just misplaced priorities again. Well, there were some potential remedies today, Paul. We'll talk about that in a second. But I've heard from people who follow this different rationales for why they see the problem is only getting worse here, uh, if anything, not better. And some say it's just the reality of today because of you have so many extended tours. We talk about all the stresses of PTSD and all of some of the consequences that follow this, especially with Iraq and Afghanistan ongoing. And then others say, listen, you have um, this culture of these com kids coming in here, these young guys, um, and this idea of violence and sexual assault that they're raised on is somehow a part of the culture they're walking into. Plus the fact that women still, because they can serve active battle roles, um, are treated as second-class citizens from the get-go. And that's communicated very clearly to everybody from the first day they're in boot camp. Uh, what do you think are the driving issues, why the numbers are only going up, not down? Well, um, I think the overarching theme that you've just described is um, really it comes to leadership. In the military culture, it is... It's embedded with stress, and a military leader has to be able to maintain good order and discipline with both men and women, and that's a fact that men and women serve professionally next to each other for decades now. So if, you, if someone contends that these young men coming into the force nowadays are under undue stress and somehow um, lean towards criminal activity as a stress release, that needs to be eradicated. And then if you're trying to um, argue the point that women coming in, not being able to serve to their fullest potential is detrimental to the overall readiness of the armed services, I would agree. So it comes down to letting the most qualified person, the most professional military member, do the job. And if you don't cut it, or if you're a criminal, you get out of the military. But I think, it really, if you take the problem up to the next level, it's the Department of Defense who has decided they're going to let the commanders try and solve this problem on their own level, and it doesn't work. It's got to go to the highest level. As you mentioned before, it's gone to the Senate today, and it's gotten the attention of the President of the United States that really the Department of Defense has to make uh, some severe and really biting changes to the way they handle these assaults in the military. And I can't understand why they would want to keep someone who is um, accused, investigated, prosecuted, even convicted of a, a criminal assault, why they would want that person to serve their country. It's an honor. And it's at the detriment of those good people who join who have been assaulted. So it doesn't matter whether it's a man or a woman doing the job. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a level of professionalism that leadership is ignoring.